Hello there, everybody. Welcome to our A-Level Computer Science live stream for Component 2. Our exam's on Friday. Hopefully, if we've got any maths people watching, uh, hopefully your maths exam went all right. Uh, feel free to tell me in the chat if it went well or not. Um, I can't do anything about it, but, you know, it is what it is. We are back for our, I don't even know how many live streams I've done now. Back for another one. That's good, Shazil. That's good. Spiders. What? Where were you, Jack? Were you in like a cleaning cupboard? Not an exam hall. Hello, hello, hello. Good. It went well. Excellent. That is good news indeed. Now, I imagine this is your last exam. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure, after uh, checking a few people's exam timetables, this is a Friday 9 a.m. exam, and it's in room 128. Yours might be different. Do check your exam timetable. Two left. My goodness. What is going on? These are very late exams. Okay, so the purpose of this live stream is to go through the component two A-level computer science stuff. So in that, we have our advanced information. Yes, Victoria. The CS paper. Well, we're going to do better on this one, aren't we? We're going to do well on this one. Stay positive. Got to stay positive. Okay, this is our advanced information. It covers the following sections. Now, we know that the advanced information isn't indicative of exactly what's going to be on the paper. However, it is a good guide as to the kind of things that are coming up. Okay, um, so we've got hardware and communication. We've got data representation, data types. We've got organization and structure of data we've got database and distributed systems the operating system and the need for different types of software and their attributes now our amplification material breaks it down a little bit further but going into that even further still this is what we need to look at and this is from the specification now apologies if that's a little bit small i'm just looking at your screen it's kind of small but basically um assembly language programming okay so that is our first one hardware and communication so I've looked at the amplification material and I've gone into the spec and had a look at what we need to cover. So assembly language programming, we need to be able to write simple programs in assembly language and demonstrate how these programs could be executed. We also have networking as well. Okay. Now networking is different than data transmission in our specification. So networking, um, describe how networks and how they communicate, uh, look at the importance of networking standards, we have uh, describe the importance and the different protocols used. So there are all the protocols stated. They can't ask you any other protocols than those stated there. And also wireless communication protocols. So explain the role of handshaking and how that happens. Identify and describe applications where connecting a portable device to a network is required. And then describe hardware requirement required to make a wireless connection. So what hardware do you need for that? Also, in addition to that, we have data types as well. So with this, data types, we have to be, talk about booleans, characters, strings, integers, and reals, and also potentially state uh, the storage requirement. Now, I've only ever seen one exam question where it's asked you to list the storage requirement of the data type. So that is potentially a good thing to look at because it may well come up. Okay. It wouldn't. I thought that, Omer, as well. VOIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol, um, is used in phones. So in the college at the moment, this year we've had our VOIP installed over our phone line. So basically we can transfer audio over um, Ethernet cable just for telephones for us. But VOIP is pretty good. If you make a WhatsApp call, for example, uh, that's VOIP. That kind of thing. So it's basically just using the internet for 
transmission of data. Okay, so we've also got representation of numbers as bit patterns. Now, it's quite a big, they didn't specify stuff in there. Um, it's quite a lot of stuff in there, quite a lot of stuff. All that is all basically all your binary stuff. We have file organization, which is mostly what I covered in, in, the, in class, which is everything from files all the way down to archiving and backups. Okay, we've got multi-level indexes in there. We've got hashing algorithms. We've got serial sequential files, index sequential files. And we're going to have a look at a few exam questions on that as well. Okay. I don't know Shazil. I don't know. They do this to us. They add stuff in. Really, they should update the specification. I agree. Now, databases and distributed systems. This is something that a lot of people are panicking about. Um, I hope you have seen the videos that I have made on normalization. And I do hope that it explains it clearly enough for you to understand. It's not an easy thing to get done in a short amount of time, normalization. Um, however, one thing that I've not covered is SQL, just because of time constraints. I don't know if you know at the moment, there's lots of year 10s in at college and it's very, very busy. However, I will go through structured query language if people want me to and I will go through some exam questions as well because I, I am certain that SQL will appear and it will be quite a large mark, number of marks. So sort of 9 to 12, that, that, that amount of marks. So it did specify that, that we need to talk about relational databases and also we talk about SQL. So when we talk about relational databases, we need to explain what a relational database is, how we get to a relational database from a flat file database, and that would include normalization in first, second, or third normal form. Now, I've never seen the exam get you from first, second, and third normal form. They will normally give you one level. They'll say, this is in second normal form. Apply the rules, get it to third normal form. Or, this is in first normal form, uh, get it to second or third this is not AQA, this is not OCR, this is the WJEC EDGCAS exam board. Okay, also in addition to that, we've got operating systems. Now in the operating systems, again, they did specify a little bit more detail. It talks about managing resources. Uh, so describe the need for and the role of the operating system kernel in managing resources, including peripherals, processes, memory protection, and backing store. So we're going to have a look at that. And also utility software as well. Explain the need for and use uh, use of a range of utility softwares. Then they moved on to chapter 7, which was the need for different types of software and their attributes. And they specified types of software will be looked at. So that will be explain the use of a range of types of software, including open source, bespoke, and off-the-shelf software. In addition to that, People have been emailing me questions about internet and intranet, and you need to do three things. Describe the use of search engines on the internet. Describe the common contemporary approach applications. Um, sorry, describe the common contemporary applications of the internet and intranet. And also, discuss the possible effects of the internet upon professional groups and the wider community. So, highlighted are the areas that we need to cover. What do we want to look at first? Pop it in the chat. Happy to go wherever we need to go to. Hmm. Two point seven SQL. Yeah, keep up, keep putting them in the chat. I'll write them down. Uh, management resources, so that's operating systems, networking, buffering, 2.6. Mm -hmm. 2.6, operating system. Okay, a lot of people saying operating systems. All right, so what I'll do is I will start off, uh, I said before, A, AA. Uh, it is... WJEC, EDUCAS. So let's have a look then at our operating systems then. Okay, now, just look at that diagram for a second. 
This is how the exam board splits up the operating system. So what you've got is the operating system manages four key areas. Okay, this is a nice little overview that it's good to sort of think about the operating system. It's it, it's like the center the center of everything. It's like the central nervous system. It tries to do everything for you to make your life easier. So the operating system manages the interface and what you see. It manages the processes behind the scenes, such as the interrupts, interrupt service routines, if you remember those, and also the scheduling of what's going on the CPU. It manages resources. So it manages peripheral devices, so things external to your computer that are plugged in. It manages memory, so that could be secondary storage as well as primary storage as well. So that's RAM uh, and ROM and cache memory. And then we've got the backing store. So the backing store is your secondary storage. So inside your memory, you've got something called partitioning and buffer, buffer, uh, buffering as well, which I'll cover both of those. And then utility software. So utility software are things like antivirus, compression software, debuggers, screensavers, system monitors. There's loads of stuff in utility software that we will cover as we go through. So firstly, how does the operating system manage resources? Now bear in mind, you may get a question on this and you might not get told that it's when we talk about managing resources, we are dealing with peripheral devices, we're dealing with memory. We're dealing with the backing store. We might even be dealing with things like file permissions in our operating system as well. So you could get asked to talk about how the operating system manages resources and you've got to bring those four things in to your exam question. On the flip side of that, you might get asked things like describe how peripherals, uh, how the operating system manages peripherals during general running of your computer, for example. Yeah, you might have to specify in a key area. So what I've done, I will send this out later, is I've put down um, some information on all of these. So how does the operating system manage peripheral devices? So when you plug something into your computer, the operating system manages peripheral input and output on your motherboard. Input devices could be, uh, and output devices could be keyboards, monitors, printers, scanners, cameras, and it controls the sending and receiving of data. So the operating system manages everything to do with how the data gets from one place to another. Now in order for an external device to communicate with our operating system, we need to be speaking the same language. And we do that using a program called a device driver. You would have come across drivers before if you've ever plugged in a piece of uh, external hardware. You've had to maybe have to download a driver for a printer, for example. Um, and on my Windows machine, printers, I have, to I have to go online and I have to download the drivers. Before that, I had to install, I had to put a CD in and it used to download the drivers on a CD. Nowadays, you're quite lucky because you have plug and play devices. So you just plug them in and they work straight away. That means the operating system that you're using already has a catalog of drivers installed. My Apple device, my Apple MacBook Pro thingy, that has lots of drivers installed and I've never had to download a single driver for a printer because it has, has them all on it already as standard. Okay? So in order for us to communicate, we need a device driver and your operating system manages that. So device drivers contain instructions of how to control a device. Each connected device has its own driver. So using device drivers brings two advantages. You've got any device can be used with the operating system as long as the driver is available for it. And the driver can be updated usually to give better performance or to remove a bug. So sometimes you might have to update your drivers on your graphics card, for example, and that might give you better performance or potentially fix a problem that's been discovered. And that's called a patch. So you send out a patch, fixes the problem, and you continue with your life. Okay? So you've got drivers, which is software, and communication comes as standard. It uses your buses on your motherboard to communicate between devices connected to your computer. Everything goes through the motherboard. When we talk about memory, we've got partitioning, buffering, and RAM. Okay, so the operating system manages memory mainly through 
the partitioning of secondary storage. So if you think about it, you may have had a laptop where you have had to partition the hard drive so you could potentially dual boot. That means run two different operating systems if you wanted to. So again, on my Apple device, because it's Apple um, operating system, I, I needed Windows on it to do Windows things. So I had to basically dual boot and split the secondary storage device into parts. And that means that your operating system has to understand which part it's using and where it's stored things. So we also have the allocation of data into buffers. So we've talked about single buffering and double buffering before. Buffers are found on external devices. They're found in your keyboard, for example, and they temporarily hold information. And then what happens is you press a key, for example, and it generates an interrupt service routine. And that then stops your operating system and says, I need attention. And then your operating system deals with the interrupt. And also we've got the allocation of data in and out of RAM. So it handles how we get things, we get data from the secondary storage device and we bring it into RAM. And then as soon as we finish with it, we take it out of RAM and then we put something else in its place, for example. So computer memory must be managed to ensure that more than one program can be run at the same time and that we have more than one document that can be opened at the same time. And we're trying to improve speed. So we need um, all the data in RAM when we need it. So the operating system is trying to make the best guess as to what you're going to need next because you're quite demanding. As the user of a computer, you're demanding things all the time. So when a program runs, it's loaded into memory, random access memory. The operating system determines how much memory the program requires and allocates enough pages. So pages are blocks of memory that are inside RAM. And it needs to allocate enough, page, uh, enough pages to actually allow you to store the entire program in RAM. And when the program is closed and when you don't need it anymore, then the allocated pages are freed up for use by another program. All managed by the operating system, it's definitely a busy thing. So don't forget pages are your blocks in RAM. And then we've got our backing store. Why would it be bad if the computer is not doing any processes? Because she's ill, you're, there'll always be processes going on and there'll be system processes in the background. Your processor will never sit idle, ever. Even though you're not, you think you're not doing stuff, things still have to be run in the background. So here we have our backing store. So the operating system manages the backing store and it does it through file handling and file maintenance. And they're some of the most important tasks that the operating system does. So we have filing systems that manage wh where things are stored. It's like an address book for where information is stored on your secondary storage device. And you would have heard me talk about FAT tables or NTFS tables. So we have FAT, which is file allocation tables, and we have NTFS, which are new technology file systems. And they are two very common um, filing systems used on computers and on also memory, memory sticks and external hard drives and things like that. Um, and think of it like a table. It tells you what's stored where through use, using pointers. So it might tell you which sector, which um, segment things are stored on on your magnetic hard drive, for example. And by using filing systems, it allows the user to create, modify, and delete files and folders. You look at it as a graphic. However, in the background, your operating system is manually handling all of the data that you're deleting and emptying your recycle bin and that kind of stuff. Also, you copy and duplicate files and folders move files and folders around in different directories, rename files and folders, sort items into different orders according to name, file type, date created and, and more, and also search for particular files and folders, and then also rest restore deleted files if needed, okay? So when you go, if you delete something, it goes in your recycle bin, you go back in, restore it, it goes back into its original place. How does it know where it lived before? And that's because your operating system is organizing and managing the file allocation tables 
or the NTFS. And then the last one there, we've got file permissions. So your operating system will organize and manage access rights. So someone with read permissions, they may read the contents of the file or the list, or they might just list the contents of their directory and no more. A hidden file is a file which has the hidden attribute turned on so that it's not visible to users when exploring or listing files. Now when it says listing files, it means through the command line. So when you're typing commands in. Yes, they are, Amir. So hidden files are used for storage of user preferences or for preservation of the state of utilities. So some files are system files and they shouldn't be edited at all, so we have to hide them. So they are created frequently by various system or application utilities. So when you download a piece of software and you're using it and you get fed up of it and you want to delete and uninstall it, sometimes you can't uninstall all the files because some of them are hidden. And that's why over time your computer might get slower. There are ways to get rid of them, however, an average user wouldn't be wouldn't do it. So the last one there, system files, they are usually essential to the operating system or a driver. So you're not allowed to just delete them willy-nilly. Just, just go ahead and just get rid of them. Because you would damage what the operating system's doing or what a driver does. And if you delete something that a driver does, you won't be able to use the device. And it's why that's why they're protected from accidental deletion or even intentional deletion through the use of permissions. Okay, so we manage resources through peripheral devices with drivers and communication across the motherboard. We've got memory, we've got partitioning, which is the splitting up of programs into different um, parts of RAM. We've got buffering, which is managing small memory modules in devices. And we've got random access memory and how things are put past in and out between primary and secondary storage. We have backing stores and file organization and file allocation tables so organizing files and folders and also managing where things are stored on secondary storage and then we've got our three file permissions read hidden and system files okay So the next thing we need to look at is utility software. Might seem quite straightforward, okay? But I'm gonna ask you a question in a minute as well. So utility software, they're the standard five that we look at. Antivirus, compression software, debuggers, screen savers, system monitors. The top three, antivirus, compression, debuggers, there are more in there that you can say as well. You can say things like, um, disk defragmentation software, task managers, which are basically system monitors, and all that sort of stuff, okay? So antivirus, you obviously know what that is, okay? We check the computer for malware, we notify the user if anything is found, and we help them remove it. You could also explain that, you know, some systems have a firewall, and that's also a utility piece of software. Compression software allows a file or folder to be reduced in size for storage or transmission. Mainly, we don't normally compress things anymore for storage because storage is readily available. What we do is we package it up and transmit it normally. So it's normally to speed up the transmission because people's internet connections aren't very good. Debuggers, debuggers help identify and resolve problems in software and they are usually built in. No, deal. you can talk about more than that. I'd imagine on a mark scheme, the examiner would be allowed to express themselves a little bit more and give credit where credit is due because there are hundreds and hundreds of different um, utility softwares. Uh, yes, Shazil, I'd say so. Know what it is. Know the basics of how it works, the steps. If you go back through my slides, you can, have, you can have a look at the steps of how it works. 
Also, we have screensavers, so they start automatically after an interval of time, and they their job is to save power. And then we have system monitors as well. This is our, this is our task manager. They allow the user and various pieces of software to track memory, processor usage, end tasks, look at connection speeds, and other, other metrics that we can look at. Okay. Now, my question to you is, can anyone tell me what the advantages are of using utility software? I'll say that again. What are the advantages of using utility software? Does anybody know the advantages of using utility software? Okay, so we've got support with the computer infrastructure. Now, I would say that's correct because what we want to do is we want the computer to be able to get on with its main job, main task. So we basically factor out and farm off all the smaller tasks to utility software. Um, it does help manage stuff and it, it means that the user doesn't have to manage it themselves. They can reduce the size of the file. That's specific for compression. I'm talking about utility software in general. Your operating system becomes more efficient. It does because it doesn't have to focus and get bogged down by all of these things. Computers use uh, parallel processing and assign threads to utility software for it to get on with its job. And that means that your operating system has quite a large chunk of processing power to deal with you and what you want as the user. Okay? It makes life easier. Uh, for who? For, for, for the user? Yes. Hardware lasts longer. Reduce power and reduce burn. That, you could, you could argue that point. You know, you could argue the point of screensavers. We prevent wasted energy processor being active all the time and efficiency efficiency of the, the entire system yes okay get rid of unused files and apps yep that would slow your computer down yes so if i was going to answer this question i'd focus on efficiency that's where i would go okay so what about the disadvantages then What about the disadvantages of using utility software? Are there any problems? Are there any things that are going to hold us up with utility software? Okay, the first two points are perfectly valid. Um, first three points are perfectly valid. And four points are perfectly valid. So yeah, it could take up memory. If we're using utility software and it's active, that is going to take up space in RAM. And believe it or not, as Mosin said, there are too many of them. You could have too many of them open. That will take up processing time. If you've got them active and working, it will slow down the device. True, there are some utility softwares that you can actually buy third party yet. People mostly stick with the primary ones that come with your operating system, but yeah, you can buy them to help you out. I had a dodgy fan once on my um, MacBook. I had to install some fan software that would speed up or slow down my fans manually um, just to test them. And it turns out I had a dodgy fan. It had a stone in it. I don't know how a stone got in my fan. But I replaced it and it worked. But I had to pay like a dollar for this stupid utility software. But there we are. Okay, so utility software doesn't seem like there's a lot of stuff in there. But you need to be prepared to talk about the advantages, disadvantages, and the use of utility software providing examples. A dollar, yes. Yeah, I imagine if it was used to incorrectly defrag uh, a solid state, it wouldn't let you do that in the first place. But you can try it. I'm not going to. I don't even have a solid, I don't even have a magnetic disk anymore. Okay. 
So they're the two that I've covered that I've covered already. Um, and as I said before, I will send this to you as a PDF. You can have a look at it and go over it. All the topics are in there. Where are we going next? We've got 2.7 SQL operating system networks 2.6. So in relation to the advanced information, it looks like about 70 marks are covered in the advanced information on average. I couldn't say exactly. 30 marks roughly are not on the advanced information. That is the best guess that I've seen across different exams in our college. Okay, but don't hold me to that. Okay, so two point. 7, uh, 2.6, if we've just done, crossed that off my list. 2.7, I'll do 2.7 first because it's quite quick. Get it out of the way, okay? Now these should be quite straightforward to you. Now we've got three different types of software. Can anyone tell me what the three different types of software are that we're going to look at? That is true. Some of the stuff isn't even on the test, yeah. Open source, bespoke, and off the shelf. Okay, very good. Now, open source software, I'm going to give you both sides. So you know open source, so open source software is freely accessible software that is editable by anybody. Normally, it's the source code that you're looking at. So usually, it is free. Okay, you can have proprietary open source software, but... It's mostly free, okay? So if you if, if you can program competently, you potentially could customize the open source software for your own needs. And the reason why open source, open source software was created was because programmers felt that we shouldn't hide our intellectual property and sell it for profit. Now that is the basic, that is the business model of people like Microsoft, okay? But there is an open source community, okay? The open source um, community or forum that will that basically release um, software all the time, and that's why Linux is so popular because it's a free. It's, it's the Linux kernel, um, the operating system is freely accessible to everybody, and you can build your own operating system from that if you know how to do that. So there is no right to support if any bugs do exist. So if there are problems in the open source software, it's tough. It's been created, it's out there, you fix it, you report it if you want to. Somebody that wants to volunteer to fix it can fix it and release another um, version of it. So more, more powerful features of paid for software may not always exist. So there might be features out there that um, bespoke software has that, that open source doesn't have. Think about it like this. You need something specific for your business. Open source software might do some of the things. However, it might not do it all. So if, you know, if you've got basic needs and there's something out there that's open source, by all means, use it. Now, can you profit off open source software? That's a question I've got for you. Can you profit off open source software? Now, Shazil, you could say a disadvantage B is that it's not open, not all open source software is easy to use for experienced developers. Um, yes, you. That's not really a disadvantage of open source itself. That's more like a, a limitation of the developer themselves. It's there for people to use, just because it's not made it easy enough for you to program, um, isn't their fault. Through donations, maybe. Yes, sponsored. No. Yeah. Okay, now, yes, you can. You can make money off it. Okay, you can't obviously just whack a front end on it and go, yep, yeah, this is my software now. Okay, what you would do is you have to accredit. You can make money through sponsorships and donations. Uh, but your open source software is out there, freely available. And if you wanted to disseminate it to lots of people, you can. They can use that then. And because it's got a Creative Commons license, people can use it. So I could have my coffee shop 
Um, and I could, you know, I could have a payment system and I could find code that handles payment systems and then I could implement that into my system and then tweak it slightly and then, yeah, I could start making money from that if I wanted to sell it. But again, always I have to accredit, I have to credit people with the, I have to credit the people that made it or where it came from. So our next one is bespoke software, the most expensive of all because it is very, very customized. So software can be customized to the user's exact needs. Unique software can provide unique competitive edge. Uh, and normally we use bespoke software if, or we we create some bespoke software if there is a need there that is so niche or that has not been created before. Okay, so it's niche or it's not been created before. And that's why we'd have to go down the bespoke route. So example of that could be if it was a fancy new um, blockchain application. There's not going to be open source software for that potentially. So I have to go down the bespoke route. I have to get it made bespoke and tailored. And the problems with that, it can be incredibly, incredibly expensive. And that's simply down to the development time. You're going to employ people to create it, something that they've not done before, something that's potentially new, and that takes time. And time is money. And because of that, the design process have to, has to happen. You have to take needs from the, from the users. You have to then start to build it, prototype it, test it. All that costs a lot of money. So it's not immediately, immediately available. So you must wait for the design development process to happen. And it might not always go right. It might not always go right. And then finally, our halfway house. The in-between our open source and bespoke software, we have off-the-shelf software. It is cheap because the development costs are spread across all of the users that buy it. But it's not as cheap as open source. It is available on demand, normally by download now. But I remember going to the shop, um, PC World or Curry's, and, and buying like Microsoft Office off the shelf, literally off the shelf. Taking the CD home and the product code and then getting stuck in on Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Microsoft Access, all that stuff. Okay, there's lots of support out there as well. Um, and that might be support through um, call centers, email support, troubleshooting guides, that sort of stuff. It's very good with off-the-shelf software. It's been incredibly well tested, but it may not solve the problem that you have. It might do some of the problems or fix some of the problems. And because of that, that's why um, Microsoft brought out uh, VBA and the, the creation of macros and things like that, automation. So you could customize parts of Microsoft if you knew what you were doing. I remember the days in university creating macros and writing VBA commands in Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, and that sort of stuff to make it do stuff for you. Okay? So users tend to pay for large numbers of features they ultimately do not use. I guarantee you, if you have used Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, or Excel, you, you would never, in your lifetime, you would never use all the features. You don't even know what they are. Neither do I. It's too much. Um, a game potentially would be off, off the shelf. It is software that's created. The cost development is split between the millions of users. You could say a game is off the shelf software. However, stick to application software. What about bespoke, Omer? He's saying that a game is bespoke piece of software. No. All right. Okay. Well, it depends. If you're getting the game made for a specific, a single person, then yeah, it is. Banking software could be bespoke. You know, if um, Barclays wanted a new. Um, iris scanning piece of software that included voice recognition, detection, and all that sort of stuff, they would have to go and write that software, and that would take a lot of time, effort, research and development, 
and that would be bespoke. So as long as you can back up your example and state your points, you'll be absolutely fine. Now down here, internet and intranet. Okay, the internet is accessible, it's global, it's large scale, it's public. Okay. Now you might have heard or seen on the on the TV um, Nadine Doris. She's our cultural minister. And she's basically in charge of our internet infrastructure in the UK. And she thought that the internet is, we can close the internet. She thought we could close it down in the UK or stop people getting onto our internet. N no, Nadine, you don't, no one controls it. It is a global infrastructure. It is far too massive for one entity to control. So the internet is everywhere. So the extranet is something that we're not concerned about, but we're concerned about the inter intranet, okay? The intranet is the organization. It's a, it's a more local level, but when I say local, please don't think geographically it's a small thing because it's not. You could have an organization that is international that shares an intranet. Perfectly fine with that, no problem. However, it is only accessible by an organization. So when we talk about the internet, I want you to think physical. Cables, routers, optical cables, different hardware, hub switches, you name it, network interface cards, wireless access points, think physical. Okay, it's the global computer network that provides information and communication facilities. So over 5 billion people across the globe are connected to the internet. And that is through a range of different things. That might be through um, your mobile data, connecting to masts. It could be satellite data, and it could be ground data, so through cables. And I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're happy with the internet because you use it all the time. And it's become massive, okay? Whereas the intranet was first properly developed and used in the 1990s. The internet came in in like, I think it was the 50s or 60s. So the, the internet was later than this, all right? And the point of it was all about internal access collaboration and communicating on an organization level. So internet software helps you connect, learn, communicate, and it's done so on a much smaller level. Now, if it's much smaller, and you were asked to compare the internet and the intranet, and it's smaller, it's more manageable for an organization. They have a level of control that the internet doesn't provide. So, because of that, Intranets are like mini internets for an organization. They can store information with the level of security that they need. Now that has its po positives and negatives. Security is an issue still. However, you know you might have news, internal news, your data that you want to share. And you have a layer to get into it. It might have it might be you have to physically be in within the organization. You may also have a specific login to get onto the int the internet itself. So, I don't know if you can see that, it's quite small. Okay, an internet has a reduced set of functions which are primarily aligned with helping employees within a business. Okay, while similar to the internet in that it's a computer network that shares information, the advantage of an internet over the internet is that it operates strictly within a closed network, okay? Like a, a local area network. Although, geographically, it can be still quite large. So it's beneficial for organizations who want to submit and exchange company information privately. So an intranet is a restricted version of the internet and no one, uh, and one that allows, sorry, sorry, and one that doesn't allow access, I can't read, to anyone outside its network. So its network comprises of all its employees at senior level, and in some cases, partners, investors, shareholders. Intranets typically use a local only network, which restricts access. So that means users have to be directly wired in. So you have to 
plug into an Ethernet port, that is top level. Like you, that is physically more secure than anything else. But the problem is that means the organization is quite small. It's only based in one place. Okay. But despite this, though, remote workers can gain access from home because they can do things like, um, what do we call it? Like the use of our gateway, for example. So you, you dial in remotely. You have remote access via a VPN. All right, so the difference between the internet and intranet is that an intranet is a closed network. So in short, internet's for all. The internet is for a selected, the intranet is for a selected group of people. Now focusing on a little bit more because the internet is something that you use all the time, you're very used to it. I went into the advantages and disadvantages of an intranet itself. So if your organization is using an intranet, it can increase productivity because of the communication that can go on. It cuts down on admin instead of sending things via like mail, physical mail, for example. Um, you can send things via instant messenger, chat, like a WhatsApp, like an internal Slack system, for example. Uh, you can also create operational cost savings. So you might not have to send or use devices across a globe. You might not have to connect to your internet, for example. And that might have cost savings involved. So it reduces errors as well. And that's like, when I say errors, I'm talking sharing information publicly, data breach errors and stuff like that. Also, it improves access to information. That one should be self-explanatory. It encourages collaboration between colleagues and also it enables crisis communication. So if something goes wrong, it allows fast, efficient and secure communication throughout your network. So there's some of the, the advantages that I came up with. Now, Mosin talked about cost there. So what are the disadvantages of using an intranet? So the first one is the usage. To set up an intranet, to get it all working, you've got your internal servers and all that sort of stuff, cost is an issue. So the cost of setting up one is normally quite high. And if you're going to invest in setting up an intranet, people need to use it. So if people don't buy into it, then what is the point? So firstly, you've got to work out whether there's a usage need. Then you have the unpredictability. Intranets are viewed as unpredictable in nature. Now, they've got multi, multi faces, they've got different graphic user interfaces. You are using them between areas in your organization like HR and your IT service team and your front end developers or your testers. And you've got your, for our organization, you've got exams officers, you've got uh, administration staff, you've there's loads of things in there and everybody needs to use it. So you've got this multifaceted thing going on where it's just a spaghetti of all kinds of needs required. And if it doesn't feed, feed the need of your people, they can get overwhelmed and they just won't use it. So also you need to think about security. What if in an organization you have a disgruntled employee who has access to the internet that could potentially cause damage within your network that is a serious problem and it's very hard to actually fight against that okay if somebody gets in externally then that is a serious problem because once they're in they're in and they, they could plant a, a back door um, and penetrate your system whenever they, whenever they want and then they could get information and then blackmail you for it and hold you to ransom also, a disadvantage, updates. Who's managing it? Who's updating it? Who's making sure it's secure? You have to pay someone to do that. Someone is going to have to manage it all the time. You've got to update your internet on a regular basis. Okay, if it's not fit for, if it's not operational 24 hours, then again, people, if they can't get access to it or they think it's rubbish, they're not going to use it. Then you've got the user experience. Okay, if internets are poorly designed, due to changing needs of your users, it's important to give members of your organization a good experience. 
So if they don't, again, if they don't like it, they can't use it, it doesn't serve their needs, doesn't do what they do, doesn't do what they need it to do for your organization, they are not going to use it. So you've got to make sure that that client experience is spot on. Yep, you can talk about um, denial of service attacks. Yep, an internal. Yep, this is a security issue. It's a disadvantage. Then you've got data overhead as well. So have you got enough space to store all the data on your intranet? And again, that costs money. Costs money to store it all. Where's the hardware? Where's the infrastructure? Who's maintaining it? Is are they updating it? So they are some of the disadvantages as well. Now, I only put them in because there isn't really much to go on with internet and intranet. Could be a small mark question, but if they throw something larger in there, you're going to need those advantages and disadvantages. Now, with our internet and intranet, what about... Um, could be Shazil, could be. If you back that up there, I think that'll be worthy of a mark. It's not always a problem, because again, you would you would say that your infrastructure needs to be in place. But if you've got poor infrastructure and you've got a heavy, heavy burden, then you know, that might cause slowing down. So a lot of people ask me via email, what is a common contemporary application of an internet or an intranet so all that means is what do we do what do we use the internet and intranet for and you know this it's just the way it was worded okay common contemporary applications what is it used for so sending and receiving emails searching and browsing information or archives copying files between computers and sending information. Nowadays, we've got financial transactions, sending payments via the internet, banking, navigating. So you could have um, internet of things you could talk about. You could touch on internet of things. If you don't know what that is, it's basically where your devices are becoming smart devices. So you could have satellite navigations, smart scooters that sends information back about GPS location, a smart bike that records and talks about information, um, how fast you go in, um, how many kilometers per hour you're traveling, how many calories you're burning, and all that sort of stuff. Also, you know, playing interactive games, that's really talking about gaming online between users, talking, sending audio information, visual information across, and you've got video and music streaming. Right now, right now, during this live stream, we've got a, a common contemporary application of the internet right here. And it looks like, you know, my signal keeps dropping in and out here. But, you know, I'm pushing 213 download here right now, but 21 upload. So my, my signal's fine. So, the only thing, the only other thing that could be asked is search engines. Because they are used as a contemporary application. It's used on the internet. Also, intranets have search engines as well, if it's done properly. So a search engine, you know what it's for, you know what it does. Google is the main search engine that a lot of people use, although although people are moving to different um, search engines. There is a search engine out there, apparently. You've probably seen adverts of this, that for every time you use it, plant a tree or something. I don't know if that's true. Is there a way to prove it? I don't know. So search engines, they're a piece of software typically embedded within a web page that allows the user to search web pages or other documents and a search engine may search a website an internet or the whole internet itself okay now ser search engines are actually very clever what they do is they send spiders out across the internet and they um, harvest hyperlinks and they work out where things are going so they, they bookmark where where this goes where that goes where this goes where that goes okay and spiders do that. And Google's algorithm for searching is incredibly intelligent. Is a, Apparently, there's over a billion lines of code in their algorithm that helps you search. Is it the same as web browsers? A search engine? No. A web browser is where you type in the domain name into there. 
or the domain address and it takes you to the server. Search engine will help you find that. So if you've got the information of where your server is, you can whack that straight in your browser and it'll take you there, but search engines help you find it. So down here, I've put some of the things that you can do with search engines. You can use specific um, wordings and it will help you search more efficiently. And you don't teach you this, okay? You're not, you're not taught this. The first time I found out that I could do anything in a search engine was in university. And it helped my searching no end. So if you search for computer science, it'll find all of the resources that contain both words. If you put computer and science and in capital, it will um, find resources that contain both words. Only both words though, not just one or the other. Then you've got computer dash science and it finds resources that contain computer but not science. Then you've got knots in there, you've got speech marks and you've got compute and then an asterisk. That's a wild card. So that comes from regular expressions if you remember what those are. Asterisk means anything. So it could be computer, computers, computing, computers, compute, anything. Okay. So 2.6, 2.7, ticked off. A regular expression is a way of filtering information, extracting information and see if it matches our grammar. Okay, similar to what Backers No Form does. 2.4, 2.4, right, okay, there's a lot of stuff in 2.4, people. Buckle in. So you don't think we won't get it. Oh, 2.8. Um, you could. I would say if you're looking at 2.8, okay, 2.8. Um, I'll touch on this at the end about what I'm going to do, but 2.8 there are all the videos on data integrity, privacy, security, cryptography, which is asymmetric and symmetric encryption. You've got biometrics, disaster planning, malicious and accidental damage. That is all being covered in videos on my YouTube channel. I would strongly recommend watching that either this evening, tomorrow, in tomorrow day, for example. Um, but I'll talk about later on what I'm going to do on Thursday about this stuff. All right, so let's get stuck into 2.4. Yep. So, organization and structure of data. There's a lot of things in here, people. Can we access that slide with the whole syllabus which links it? Yes, you can. I'll send it out later. Files and file design. Master and transaction files. Now, master and transaction files have been specifically spoken about. All right. And what we need to do is be able to talk about what they are and also draw that diagram. Okay, that diagram is quite important. We've got serial and sequential files as well as index sequential, hashing, algorithms, multi-level indexes, file security, and archiving. Now, if I talk very quickly, I do apologize, but there is a lot of stuff in this, okay? If at any point you've got questions, fire them in, and I'll try and answer them as we go. Now, before we start, you need to make sure that you know what files are and what records are, because I'm going to be using those words an awful lot. Okay, records are a collection of related fields. Okay, a record is a collection of related fields. A file is made up of related records. So, for example, in here, let me get my little pointer. I'll get my pen out, actually. So, in here, where's my pen, where's my pen? There it is. So in here, these are fields, all right? Field, stop it. Field, 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 field. That makes up one record, one record, one record, one record, one record. All the records make up a file. Okay, you need to know that before we begin. Or you could say, a file is a collection of related data handled as a single unit. The single unit is the file, the file name. 
Okay, a file has a file name, which a user can use to access data at a later date. Okay, when we design files, we have fixed or variable length records. Now, fixed length records, in the exam, I can't see this happening, but they might ask you to work out how large a record is. To do that, you just add it all up. Yeah, look at the table, go over to the size section, okay, and add them all up. And you've done this, you've talked about what's going to be inside your files, and you did that in your coursework, if you remember. You did something like this, a data table, and it has the data type and the size and what validation you were going to use. Okay? So fixed length records are used in order to store records the same way. And you've seen fixed length records used before in things like uh, random access. Now, records have multiple data types. They're not fixed, like arrays, and that's why we use them. So fixed length records put additional requirements on every record, and they need to make sure that every record is exactly the same size. That's important later on. And the size must be stated up front. Now, the only problem is with that is that over time, if you don't use all 20 um bytes of this string for example yeah and you only use 10 then you're gonna have 10 wasted spaces in there so you need to bear that in mind you might waste white space okay and integers you won't be asked about this but integers come in two types you've got signed and unsigned bits so what do we use the sign for negative binary okay but you won't, you won't get asked about that so I'm going to skip past estimating a file size because, like I said, you just add it up. And this is where we get stuck in now. Our first one, serial files. The most simple of all files. Most straightforward method of storing records. Things to remember, serial files, when you're putting a record in a serial file, it gets appended at the back of the file. Okay, All records are therefore stored in chronological order, that is time order. So the first record in your file will be the first record that was stored in the file. The last record in the file will be the last record stored in the file, obviously. Now it's important to remember that if you're using serial files, you need to open them in what we call append mode. So there are three modes when you're file handling. Read, write, and append. Read reads the data from the file. Write writes it anywhere in the file. And append adds it to the end. And that forces the data in the right place. So far, so good. Nice and straightforward. Simple, simple little files. So serial files tend to be used for situations that do not require any order. The number or records are the number of records are normally quite small. We don't want to keep large data in there. But why would we not keep hundreds of thousands of records in a serial file? Does anybody know why we wouldn't keep hundreds of thousands of records in a serial file? Think about your algorithms. What if we needed to, yes, well done, Mahadi. Yes, it's all about searching. Okay, we want to keep it sorted. Perfect, yes, good. Oh, well done, yeah. Yep, searching, even a linear or a binary search. Yep, good. You all got it. So data must be stored in the order that it arrives. So for, for example, in your exam, if you wanted an example, you could say recording the times of swimmers as they finish a race. That would be ideally suited. Okay, you could say a running race. Anything to do with time, really? Okay. So, what about sequential and indexed sequential? Okay, sequential, sequence, have an order to them. An indexed sequential file uses an index like a book. Okay, so things are grouped now. So start thinking about groupings and ordering of data. So sequential files will order records based 
on a primary key field. Okay, primary keys are unique, but they are based on a primary key field. One field in the fixed length record will be used to order the records in either ascending or descending order. So one of the data items in the record will, will be used to sort it. So for example, normally we have like a booking reference or a user ID. And user IDs might start at 1111. And the next person that gets created will be 1112 and 1113 and 1114. And they would go in order in my file. So a sequential file offers a number of advantages over serial files when it comes to searching. And that's because of what you told me before. We need to have it in order in order to apply things like a binary search. And if we keep it in order and we use this file, we don't need to sort it. We don't need to bring a sorting algorithm in. And that saves a lot of time and processing power. So inserting into a sequential file and deleting from a sequential file is what you're going to get asked about. Look at the past exam questions. This is where they always go to. Okay, Inserting into a sequential file is more complex. And you could say it's more complex because it needs to be in the right place. Yes, it does. So what we do is we have a system for that. In order to add a new record, the position in the file where the record is to be added must be found. So we need to know the point of insertion first. So if it's not possible to move records, we need to end up copying to a new file. And that means we need a temporary file to do that. So here we go then. What's our process of adding or inserting into a sequential file? So when inserting, records get copied from the original file into a temporary file. You copy them one by one until the insertion point is found. When you get to the insertion point, you add your new record into the temporary file at the end, and then you copy the rest of the data from the original file over to the temporary file. And now your temporary file basically has the updated record in there in the right place. And then what we do is we delete the old or the original file and we rename our temporary file whatever the name of the original file was. So nobody, I was going to say nobody is none the wiser. Everybody's none the wiser. So nobody knows because it happens that fast nobody nobody knows. And all you see is the new the new record inserted into the file and that's it. So then explaining the process of deletion, you do the same thing. You create a temporary file. You copy all the records into the new temporary file to the point where you want to delete the record. You get to that point of deletion. You skip over the record and don't copy it across. And then you copy the rest of the records into the new temporary file. So deletion, as I've said before, deletion is not true deletion. It's basically not copying into a new file. That's what deletion is using sequential files. Does anybody have any questions about inserting or deleting from sequential files? It's very important, this. I have a feeling this is going to come up. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I'll just carry on. If people do have questions, do stick them in the chat. Now, we move on to indexed sequential files. Oh, a deal. Could you get asked to pseudocode it? Uh, I don't think you would get asked to pseudocode it. No, I don't think you would. I'd be very, very surprised. 
What are these files used for? Index sequential files? You talking about these ones? Index sequential files, the main advantage is grouping data so it's faster for searching, getting the sequential files, they're just used to keep the order. So it's large, large amounts of data with sequential files because of the searching element. Organization of data, that kind of thing. So index sequential files, obviously they contain an index like your bookmark. And it makes accessing groups of records much faster for searching purposes, even faster than sequential files. The index will group data into logical chunks and store file the file location where that group of records began. We jump to that section and then we search through it like that. So it means that when searching through an indexed file, you only have to search the group of the search item and then find the actual search item itself. And that speeds up finding records. So if the only difference is that we've got a group to group data together, then what are the disadvantages to that? Again, because you've now got groups, it makes insertion and deletion an absolute nightmare because not you've got to change the start positions of the groups if something changes. So if it's expanding, contracting on a regular basis, there's lots of processing going on reorganizing and making sure the pointers are in the right place. So every time a record gets added and removed, the start position of the other groups all begin to change. So you've got to keep updating all the time. It's the major disadvantage to this. Now, you know, if we go in index sequential files, if the exam mentions anything about index sequential files, in your head, you must think about multi-level indexes. Multi-level indexes. Index, multi-level, index sequential. You've got to think about it. It's in the mark schemes for all of these discussions on index sequential files. So, having an index can speed up because we've, we've ordered things into groups. So what if we had groups within groups within groups within groups? Would that be faster still? The answer is yes. So what if the index was so large that it took time to search the first index and then to find the group of records pointed to by that index? You'd have to, you'd have to then go into another group and group it again and group it again and group it again. And that's where multi-level indexing comes in. Okay, having groups of groups. Now I just want to take a look an exam question on this because they look weird they look terrifying but they're really not so what I've done is I've got an exam question and it says explain the use of multi-level indexes and draw a diagram to demonstrate the operation of a three level index now we did this in class okay Award one mark, this is the mark scheme, award one mark for each point up to a maximum of three. Award one mark for three tables with appropriate labels. So for example, I don't know if you can see this because it's absolutely tiny, right? But it says main index, okay? Main index. It has a key and an index location, right? The key is the primary key. That is your unique identifier that we order and we sort things by, okay? So now what you've got in here is they've got a key and an index and the index location says 04. So it goes to index 04 and then it says key index location 047. So within 04, you've got subcategories up to a minimum of 047. And then it goes to index 47. And then you've got your disk address. Now, if you're going to draw this, 
in your exam, it must have actual data at the end. And normally, our actual data is drawn, if you're doing this in real life, uh, drawing a schema, it would be like a, look like a, what looks like a barrel. And the barrel is basically a secondary storage device. But you could just do, do a rectangle, no problem with that whatsoever. But it must have the final disk address because you have to point to the data in the last one. Okay, if it had four, if it said it wanted a four level index, then what you would do is it said you'd, you'd add another um, number on the end. So I could say zero, four, seven, one points to index four, seven, one. And again, you'd have two columns in there and it would point to disk address, and you'd have your final data, okay? It's really not that bad. All you have to do is remember what the table structure looks like. Main index, point to next index, point to next index, point to next index, and then point to the data. What if you, how do you get these numbers? You make them up, okay? Normally what we do in the main index though, is we start on like a two digit number, could be three digits if you wanted to, then you would have inside that, this denotes that there's more indexes inside the 0, 04 index, and that's why I did 0, 04, 7, 1, because that denotes that there are more indexes inside that also. That could be anything from 1 up to 9. What does it say next to key? It says index location. Index location. Okay. So then it says there is uh, there is a main that contains the location of the next index. This process may be extended to several levels. The last index contains the physical address. The physical address. All right. So, let's have a look at a question on this then. I don't know if you can see that again. Can you see that? Let me know if you can see it. You can't see it. It says a three-level indexed sequential file system stores computer records which have a key field values in the range of 0000 to 9999. Only a few of the possible key field values have currently been allocated to customers. To save money, uh, sorry, to save memory space, index blocks are only created when required. At present, only three index blocks shown in the diagram have been created. Customer records are stored on the disk in data blocks. Each data block may contain up to 10 customer records. Records within any one data block have key field values which differ only in the last digit. 5470 to 5479 are stored sequentially. Sequentially means in order, remember? Okay, so the first question says, explain how new customer records 3892 and 3893 are to be added to the system. Mentioning the creation and linking of necessary index or data blocks. So what we want to do is we want to understand first that these data blocks can be, so our first level index is from, let me just get this here, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way up to 9,000, okay? Now this one here is 5,000, that it points down to the 5,000 index because we break the next one down, so 5,000 goes from 5,000 up to 5,900, so each each column of the number goes from 0 to 9. So 5,000 
and then it, we, we need 5400. Zero, zero. We go down to that, we go 5400, zero, zero. then we need 5470, and that gets us to 5470 zero to 5479. So what we need to do is first create a second level. So our entries are going to be, so we need 3892. So we're going to go 3000, so we're going to start here, and we're going to go to, let's draw, I'm going to draw it for you. I'd have my table like this. Draw my key field. Draw my pointer. And then what I would do is I would have my set. I'll just copy what they've done. Look, 5,000. They've gone from 5,000 to 5,000. Okay, so I've got 3,000 in there. And it goes up to 3,900. All right. I'd obviously complete this. I'd obviously complete this, wouldn't I? So we create a second level index block with the entries from 3,000 to 3,900, and we link the pointer from 3,000 in the first level index to the start of this block. So that should actually be pointing down there. Okay. Then what we do is we then create a third level block with the entries from 3,800 to 3,890. So same. 3,800 to 3,890. And then this next one. What was our number? 3, 8. So we'd have 3, 8. Like that. Point in there. And then this would point to 3, 8, 9, 2. So I'd do this one, third level block. And probably, judging by what they've done there, I would have just my... This is so difficult to draw with this pen. Incredible. Now, do I draw another table or do I draw the end data structure itself? Remember, I'm looking for 3892 and 3893. So do I draw another table or am I going for my data structure? My data store. End data. End data. Another table then end. Hmm. I need to open. Oh, okay. So from this one, now if you look at my number, 3892, what I would do is I need to point from this one. Let me just get my eraser for a second. So I need to go here remember all these would have uh, titles as well by the way that's the proper way to do it so on here I would have three eight nine zero three eight nine one three eight nine two three three eight nine three three Eight, nine, four, blah, blah, blah. On, onward, 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 yeah? And then, in these, because there's two, I'd have my data store. So if you look at the last one, um, it would be index. So you'd put index...
that's the proper way to do it index 3000 index 3800 index 3890 what am i looking for 3892 yeah 3893 you could point them to separate ones if you wanted to and that'll be you done no it's just the the only reason you use the title is just to point out what um what index you're in that's all Okay, now if you did that final one there, if you pointed to if you pointed to this one, okay, that would still get you the final data itself. In their example, if you wanted to do it like this and then point out from there, for example, if you wanted to do it like this, like I was doing originally, oh my goodness, my drawing is absolutely shocking. You could put in there three... Eight nine zero two three eight nine nine, and you know that yours is contained within there. Okay, if you wanted to follow their example, that would be accepted. If you wanted to do the specific way of getting both, you could do that. Okay, most people would go with this way, the, the second option, because that's the way they did it, and they're guiding you in with this here. Now this question though, if you draw on this in 6A, okay, if you draw on that, this question isn't about drawing. Can anyone tell me why it's not about drawing? Good. Okay, I was testing. I was testing some some T level students um, today, and they were, and, and well, yesterday, sorry, and they missed the the command word of the question. So you, it says explain. So explain means that you would explain what you have done there. So I would say that from the first index of three thousand, you would point to a second index and create that, and the second index would go from three thousand to three thousand nine hundred. Now we're looking for 3.8, so you would go from that next index and create the pointer to a third index, which is index 3.800, and it would go up to 3.890. And then, because you've done that, you would then point to the data item of 3.890 to 3.899, and that's where your data would be. That would get me all five marks for explaining the diagram that I've drawn there. But in my head, I'm drawing the diagram in my head. Okay? Do with bullet points, not with an explain question. I wouldn't recommend doing that with bullet points for explain. Um, but yeah, the second question, explain how the computer would access records 3893 at a later date. So all you're doing for those three marks, it's a ridiculous question, because all you're doing is explaining the process backwards. I've lost my pen again, there we go. You'd, you'd say, well, begin at the first level index, and you would start at uh, 3,000, and you'd go to the second level index block, which is over here, and then you'd say you'd follow the pointer from 3,800 to the third level index block, and then you'd follow the pointer from 3,890 to the data block on the disk, which is here, and then you'd extract the required record from memory and you take it and you put it in your random access memory okay that's all you would do you just explain how you go and retrieve it that's all for three marks are there any questions on that okay I'll include the mark scheme in the presentation when I send it out for you so you can have a look are there any questions on that we are one and a half hours in people how many have we done 
one, two point six, two point seven, two point four we're on. When an index is open, does it take up memory? Not necessarily. You're searching for information, so you've not done anything with memory yet. You're accessing what's already there. So part B, can you use that? Yes, you can use diagrams to, to support. Yeah, I, was, I would, I'd probably do that, to be fair. But I'd, I'd still write about it thoroughly because it's asked me to explain. Right, part B, how, explain how the computer would access record 3893. So you go to 3000, you go to the next index at 3000, you then go up the index to 3800, you go to the next, the third level of your index at 3800, and then you would extract at 3890, you would then go to the data itself, extract the data you need for 3000. 893 and then you would take that and put that in random access memory ready for use so you just follow it through the tables follow it through the tables follow it through the tables once you get to the data pull it back and put it in random access memory okay so moving on in uh, 2.4, that just explains what we've just been through with our multi-level index. Um, disadvantages of multi-level indexes, I'm just go back for a second. You see all them tables there. If there's not a lot of data and you've got lots of indexes, there's a lot of wasted space. All that's wasted, wasted, wasted. Wasted, wasted memory. Wasted, 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 wasted. That's the main disadvantage for me. Lots of wasted data. That's only if your multi-level index is not f not being used efficiently. It's not full. Okay, it performs better when it's got more data in it. Advantage is that it's more organized. Faster searching by grouping data. Okay, now we need to talk about random access files and hashing algorithms. Now, we've been through this before, haven't we? But random access involves jumping to a record directly without the need to search for anything. So the reason why we can jump straight to it is by using a hashing algorithm. Okay, we need to find the record start position without having to probe it or interrogate the file in any way. So this means that the only information that you have is the data you are searching for, okay? And that is most likely to be that primary key in our table, okay? Because it's unique, it's unique data to the, uh, the data set. Uh, yes, you can say there's added complexity. It's more to do with pointers have to be updated when you delete data, Maddy. All right. So in order for us to use the data that's provided to find the location of where the data is stored, we use a hashing algorithm for that. So when you give the hashing algorithm uh, the primary key, it will produce the index position in the file. It must produce the same key every time, the same index key every single time. So if I put in the data John, it should always return the key three. If I put in data John again, it will always return three. Put in John again, always return three. Okay. And that's what a hashing algorithm is. Data in, index out. So direct and random access files are slightly different. Okay. A direct access file is split up into blocks. And each block contains a fixed number of records. So you could have 10 records in there, 10 records in there, 10 records in there, 10 records in there, 10 in there, 10 in there, and 10 in there. Okay? 
the hashing algorithm will generate the start position of the block. So remember, this is direct access. Okay, so you have data that goes in, our fluffy little cloud, which is our hash. This is our data. And then it spits out the index position. Okay, now the index position is the, in, in direct access is the start location, the start of the block. It's not the actual data, it's the start of the block. Then what we do is we generate or we create a linear search to go through all 10 records inside that block. Okay, the file has a maximum capacity and is created on the storage device in full. I remember when I told you the story of Sam, him creating his random hashing algorithm um, that created such a large index that everything before that data that was stored is white space and it fills up with white space it's wasted memory okay so a disadvantage of using direct access is that the file is created in full and it wastes a lot of space so each block starts off as blank data but will take up space on the disk so if each record has a size and each block contains um, R number of records, then each block will be S by R bytes in size. So the number of blocks in the file is decided before any data is added to a file. Now, please don't let that phase you there, okay? Because if I said to you, here is my file, each one contains 10, each block contains 10 files, Sorry, each block contains 10 records. I could say each each record record is 5 bytes. You could say well, that's 5 times 10. That's 5 times 10, 5 times 10, 5. Times 10. You could work it out, okay? Don't get hung up on this formula garbage. It's quite straightforward to work out, so don't panic about it. Right? If there's only a few blocks, then the chance of having to do a linear search increases. Okay, So if I've got two blocks and it contains a thousand records in each block, that is not going to be very good for a linear search, is it? Okay, If there are too many blocks, in, on the other hand, and you have this situation where it goes well off the screen, and you've got all these blocks and each one contains 10 records, so you, you're, you're gonna waste so much space, you've gotta think about the right balance. Okay, so for this example, I'll skip through this, it's not really important, that's just working out the size again, using this example, all right? But the more full a random access file gets, the worse it performs, okay? The worse it performs, the more full it gets. We need to strike the balance. If all of our blocks are full, what's going to happen? If all of our blocks are full and we try to add another piece of data, what is going to happen? Somebody tell me. This is WJEC, Educas. Overflow. Right, we might use an overflow. We're going to get a collision, aren't we? And then we're going to potentially have to use an overflow. So we need to try and keep each block to a minimum. All right. Now, the ratio between the number of records stored and the maximum number that you can store is called the load factor. And I said to you in class, the load factor needs to be roughly 50%. Okay. Uh, for a deal, a deal your question there, okay, direct access is going to the start of the block. Random access is going, there's no blocks, they're all individual. So you go direct to the data. Yeah, random access goes direct to the data, there's no blocks. Okay.
So a hashing function needs to be quite specific. If this is the ingredient that makes us store things effectively, it needs to be robust. Right, Mahadi, the load factor is how much data you have in a block compared to how many slots you have in that block. So you could have a load factor of 100% if you filled up all the blocks with data. You had 10 blocks and you had 10 items of data in there. Show you that again. Okay. There you go. The ratio between the number of records stored and the maximum number that can be stored is the load factor. Right, so when we're creating hashing, if you get asked a question on hashing functions, like where, how do you create one? What are the ingredients you put in there to actually build a good one? Well, these are the rules that we went through, remember? Deterministic, uniformity, data normalization, continuity, non-invertible. So remember, when given the same key, it should always produce the same result. If I put John in, it should always produce three. Deterministic uh, uniformity, keys should be spread out evenly. You want to spread them out over the blocks that you have. Okay, there's your blocks. Blocks, 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 blocks. You want data in there, you want data in there, you want data in there, you want data in there. You want data in there. If it was going data all in the same block, yeah, that would be terrible. Keys should be normalized before being hashed. So you might make them lowercase. So if I put John in there, John, John, that would produce two different index positions because these are different when they get when they get turned into numbers ASCII they're different then you've got continuity keys that differ by a small amount should result in the index position differing by a small amount as well yep describing them will be fine Mahadi yep describing them will be fine so the non-invertible. So I can't put I can't put John in, and it produces the index key of three. And I can't. That means I can't put three in, and it will return John. It is not invertible. You can't go backwards, and you can't go forwards. It's literally data in, index out. Data in, index out. Data in, index out. Fantastico. There's an example. We don't need that. I'll send these out to you later on. If you are another student from somewhere else, not in Oldham Sixth Form College, I'm happy to send this out to you as well, by the way. You know, it's not just for Oldham Sixth Form College students. You just need to provide me with your email address. My email address is jbr at osfc.ac.uk. Feel free to email me. I'll send it out to you. So what's the difference between hashing function? Yep, same thing, Omer. Yeah, it's semantics. Semantics, that's all. Now, this is the situation we have. Even though we have stored Bert and Sally, they have both been stored in the same block, and technically, that is a collision. Technically a collision, okay? The more, the more of these that we store in the same block, potentially, the longer the linear search has to happen. So, the types of overflow we use. Overflow is a small section on the end of your file. Overflow. Someone tell me why overflows are bad. Why are overflows bad? I mean, the good thing is they store the data instead of you losing it, but why are they a bad thing? Overflows. Yes, we have to linear search it. Yes, yes, linear search, linear search. Good, good, yeah, long to access. Good. So yes, collisions are created by hashing functions or hashing algorithms and they can lead to more records being stored in a single block. We know this by now. As each block has a maximum record count, what happens if the record fills up? We've got two options. If the record is full, we have two options. One, we can create an overflow area and place the record in there. Okay? If we don't want to use an overflow, people, what, what can we do? What's the other option? The last, the last 
attempt to save this, what is the last resort? Ooh, not flag overflow. Good, Mariam. We create a whole new file and rehash everything. That is the worst thing that we can possibly do. Worst thing. And that's why they're, okay? They are the two options we have. So if I, if I was the examiner and I asked you, a block is now filled up with data. What options could you take in order to deal with the situation? You would say, one, you can create an overflow, or two, create a new file. Then you're going to discussing what the benefits of those things are or what disadvantages of those things are. And they're on the screen there. An overflow is the lowest cost. It's more manageable. Yes, we might get linear searches, but you know it might just be a one-off. We might just store a couple of data items in there and it'd be fine. If we keep getting the overflow filling up or our blocks keep filling up all over the place, we need to change the number of blocks and improve our hashing algorithm. And the load factor is the trigger. So if you're getting lots of load factors triggering, then we need to rehash. Shazil, don't jump the gun, my friend. If we do create an overflow, okay, if we do create an overflow, then we have a couple of different types, don't we? We have progressive overflow, which is if the location is occupied, so if the location we're trying to store it in is occupied, we use the next available location in the block. If the end of the file is reached and we've gone all the way to the end, we wrap around and start searching the block again. The load factor is the ratio of how many records you can store in a block against how many the capacity of the block itself. That's what load factor is. So for example, if I had one single block and I had 10 slots, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Okay, well, it's not 10, but there you go. What we'd do is we'd fill this block up here, 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 fill this block up here. The load factor would get over 50%. Okay, 100% load factor is when all blocks are filled. That is a serious problem. Because you're, you're going to get a collision every single time then. All right. So progressive overflow. Our flag overflow. So we flag the original block and we move the data to the back of the file in a designated overflow for linear searching. All right. So with progressive, what we would do is we try and go around the block until we find space. So we get to the end, go back round, put it in, go back round, put it in, go back round. Now that's not very good because if we do find a free space, we're going to put it in there and then again you risk the cause of collision. This is probably the more approved method, the flags, because you're using a designated overflow space. So you put a flag on it and you go, something was stored here, go and try the overflow. You hit it, you go flag, okay, it goes to the overflow. Start linear searching, off you go. Happy days. So that's random access and direct access and hashing algorithms. The next thing to talk about, do both index sequential and direct random make use of overflow? Yes, they do. If only if needed. So now you've got two types of transaction files, okay? Now these are created for a batch process, yeah? Remember batch processes? Lots of data over and over again. Um, some files contain vast amounts of data. For example, a log of phone calls made through a mobile phone operator. So th this data is required for audit purposes, GDPR, creating bills, data mining. So however, Inserting and updating things like files can be a slow process if all the data was just in one big dirty filthy file, okay? We want to try and speed things up. So we do that, we use two files. We use something called 
a transaction file, which is our day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month file, relatively small amount of data. And then we have our archive. I call it an archive because that's what it's for. It holds all the data since you started. So that's all the data in one place. Still, it's still a great, great big, dirty, filthy file. Okay? But transaction files, they store data collected over a short amount of time, like the current month, talking about bills. So although the amount of data that it will produce is still quite large, it's nowhere near the same as a master file, so they're much more efficient to search. So they're, they act as basically temporary files, and they help to keep the system running pretty quick, and they store the required data that we need. So we can still interrogate transaction files when needed. So at the end of the short time scale, what we do is we have to update the master file and basically append the transaction file into the master file. And that process is something that you're going to have to diagrammatically do, potentially. So master files, they'll store all the data required to perform a batch process, like generating bills, calculating your mobile phone bill, utility bill, something like that, or generating reports. And they are also used to perform data mining. And remember what data mining is? It's searching through large amounts of information that's useless to find meaningful information. When we mine the ground for diamonds, we dis- we destroy lots of ground and break up lots of rock to find tiny little stupid diamonds, okay? Because it's rare. You can have multiple transaction files, yes, and you can combine them all together. No problem with that. All the examples we use just contain one because it's easier just to explain, okay? Master files, they don't get used day to day. They're too large and too unwieldy. And the only time we do actually interrogate them is if there is an archival need to get the information back. Okay, so we don't search them unless absolutely necessary. And this is the diagram you need to be able to draw. Remember the snails? Yes, the snails are back, people. The snails are back. So I'll just draw me a little snail. Now, two sides you have, these are the old magnetic tape symbols. That's what they are. So below is an example of a typical master and transaction file update process. You have your original master file, okay, the OG. And we have the sorted, sorted transaction file. Can someone tell me why the transaction file is sorted? What's it sorted in? Why is it sorted? Yep, time. It's chronologically sorted or ordered. Good. Do master files have a security issue? Because if you want access to all the data, then you just need to access the master file. Yes, they do. They do. They are protected. Time order. Yep, perfect. Thank you. So, with this here... Um, we've got our sorted transaction file. And then what we do is we need to combine these together. And we combine them in a rectangle, which is basically a process, if you remember anything from flowcharts. There's our process. So we update by comparing records from each file. In your exam, if you're asked about this, and you were given a specific scenario, like creating your gas bill, okay, you would write um, units of gas multiplied by the cost um, and then you produce your bills okay you make it specific to the scenario that's given in the question in there and you print reports out you could just draw if you wanted to you could just draw a piece of paper like that and just say bill right as long as they know that you've outputted something for the user fine then what you do is after the comparison has happened and you produce the units and cost in the transaction file, you would then merge the master and transaction file together and that would produce the updated master file. That is the OG master file plus the transaction file. Append on the end. All right. What's the error file for? Well, if... 
like I said in class, if I'm Barbara or Betty, I can't remember what name I used, right? And I'm sat there producing bills manually, it's not very efficient. So we use a batch process. I click a button and it runs through everybody's accounts, it takes all the gas they've used and produces the bills and then emails them out, prints them, PDFs them, whatever, right? If I set it off and I go home, because that's what batch files are for, they just make use of processing when there's not much load on the system, like overnight, for example. You set it off, you go home. Come back in the morning, five bills have been done, you've got 6.7 million left to do, problem. So what happens, instead of the system stopping, you would just put any problems that occur, just go in an error file, and this is then manually checked through. Okay, we manually check the error file if needed. Key things to point out on this diagram is students often forget the arrows. Quite important because they show the direction of where things are going and show what's produced. The symbols, not so much needed, but if you can remember them, the snails, do so. You, eyes and mouth not necessary. So let's have a look at an exam question. Here we go. Describe data processing, a data processing system which makes use of a master and transaction file to produce utility bills. Eight marks. The reason why I wanted to show you this is because it's not a diagram. Don't use rectangles. Don't use rectangles. Okay, try and stick to the shapes that you saw. Rectangles mean processes, that's why. And a master and transaction file is not a process. So I would stay clear. Now then, eight marks, okay, you would say circles. Go for circles. My goodness. Describe a data processing system which makes use of master and transaction files to produce utility bills. So you would talk about inputs, processes, and outputs. What needs to go in, what needs to be processed, and what needs to be spat out. So you would say, updated meter reading and the new customer slash amended customer details. Okay, you have to think on your feet here because the um, it's all about utility bills. And I understand that many of you have never paid a utility bill. Wait till you get to the age where you can pay utility bills and gas is about £4.7 million pounds per cubic meter of that stuff. Okay, so... There we are. Inputs, updated meter reading, new customer slash amended customer details. The process is sorting of transaction file in key field order to match the master file. You merge the data together and you calculate the cost used. So that, just get rid of all my ink. So you've got updated meter reading new customer. So this is from your transaction file. You then sort it and merge it. So you sort it here, merge it in here, calculate the electricity used. That goes again in here in the processes. Then you've got the outputs. You've got the updated master file, updated master file. You have the customer bill, which gets spat out the bottom, and you have the error log here. So you've got input, input, process, Output, job done. All right. The, the answer, does the app, I would contextualize the answer. For marking purposes, they've kept it short and sweet there with bullet points. So I would actually turn this into words. I would say um, the master and transaction files will contain information. The transaction file will contain information over a short period of time, such as the customer details and the updated meter reading. The master file will contain all the information previous about the customer. When it goes into the process, the sorted transaction file is sorted in chronological order to match the master file. During the process, this gets merged. What I would do is again, if you want to draw the diagram, by all means, draw the diagram. But again, I would contextualize the answer. I would still explain what's going on. 
the question in this on this exam board is normally quite specific when it says draw or explain or describe. If in doubt, draw the diagram, because I would be I would I would be very upset if you didn't get marks for a diagram as well. Some marks, maybe not all, but some. Now we look at backups. Backup and archiving know the difference, people. A backup is the process of copying files. Do not get this mixed up. I will I will find you. Okay, I've seen this before so many times. Students get it mixed up. It's the process of copying data, copying files from the main area to a separate area. You are backing up. You're making a copy. That way, if you delete something or you delete a backup, you can retrieve it again from somewhere else. Okay, every network has a backup policy. The college has a backup policy, even though they have lost stuff before. On exam accounts, I mean. So students delete stuff on exam accounts. It doesn't have a backup on it. It's ridiculous. It's very common for files to get deleted by accident. You know, you know, Barbara deleting stuff or Butterfingers, press the delete key, whatever. Idiot. Right. Backup policy. So when creating a backup policy, you might get asked a question specifically on this. Right. Backup policies come under backups. So you need to think about where it's going to be stored. What building it's going to be stored. Is it in the cloud? Is it physical? Can you touch it? You know, it's going to be stored on a server, hard disk drive, magnetic storage. What will it be stored on? Again, server, hard drive, that kind of stuff. How often will the backup be taken? You know, if I'm a bank, it's going to be very regular. If I'm a college, maybe not so regular. I'll obviously take my backup when there's no load on the system, so overnight. How long will it be kept for? Well, I'll update every week, so it's going to be kept for a week and then discarded. Okay? So with backups, they can take forever to do. So what we want to do is do it off-peak. The more often a backup's done, the more secure the data will be, obviously. But it takes a large amount of storage capacity to do that, and it takes a large amount of time. So we can't back up the whole thing all the time. So there is something for that, okay? There is a trade-off between how often you do the backup and how long you keep the data, because you don't want to fill up your storage. So... Eventually, no matter how much storage is used, old backups need to be deleted. You need to get rid of to make space. Now, the modern approach to doing this is something called the incremental backup. And that's where you make a full backup first, and then you only back up the changes that have been made. Okay, But you need to state that you do a full copy, a full backup first, and then only changes. And that is much faster. That's why banks go for incremental backups because they only want transaction changes. They don't want the whole thing to change. All right? That means we can do it more often, we can do it much faster, and we're good. So with our backups, when I said where we're going to store them, you know, think about disasters that can happen. The data is the most important asset to a company normally. So we need to store them in something where it can be protected. So that might be a fireproof box. The cloud is great because, one, we are passing the responsibility to a third-party company, although we have to pay for it. They have the best hardware, the best software, the best backups. The, they have people dedicated 24 hours working on protecting our data and keeping it safe. The security is their responsibility. If I get, if I lose my data, I'm not going to be sued for it. It's them, technically. When it comes to archiving, backups are copy. Archiving is not. It's moving the data to another a location. So there's no backup of it. It gets moved in its entirety. Okay. Archiving is the back is the process of moving a file or record from the main system to a separate archive system. And what is the benefit of doing that? It's going to speed up, give you more space to do whatever you need to do. Okay, it's gonna potentially speed up your system, okay? Improve the overall run of the main system, but still give access if the need should arise. We keep your data for about six years, and then we delete it. That's more of a GDPR thing, but we don't want all your data clogging up our database. So, you know, we want to get rid of you as fast as we can in the nicest possible way. Once the file's been archived, it needs to be stored somewhere. 
So bear that in mind. Okay? And that is all of chapter 2.4. 2.4. How long have we been going for now? My goodness. Ugh. If archiving is moving a file, then what if you want to access it? Will there still be a copy in the main storage somewhere? Well, yeah, I mean, it's archived. It's archived, like, it might be archived on a hard disk drive, for example. Okay? All you do is you go and get the hard disk drive and you plug it in and you access it and get whatever information you need from it. That's all. Worst case scenario, you've got to move it back into wherever you moved it from to reaccess it. That's all. That's all it's saying. Yeah. Now, people, we've been going for... What oh, forgot here? Uh, we've been going for... Uh, what was it? What time was that? Seven, eight, nine. Two hours. Archive is like old data you probably... Yeah. It's data that you don't frequently use, so you get rid of it. You move it out of the way. That's all. So I've got an archive of all my computer science lessons from 2000 and... When did I start? 2016? 2016, 17, 18... 19, all of it's moved onto an external device. Because I don't use it anymore. But then again, I might need something. So we'll go and get it back. All right, so for a deal there, on Thursday, the issue I'm having, the reason why I've not sent any information out yet, is because I want to do our revision session on Thursday. At what point that will be, I'm unsure at this point. I'm hoping to find out tomorrow morning because one, uh, lots of year 10s are in and the two, room 242 has been taken over for three weeks entirely. So I can't use 242. The big room's gone. 253, our normal classroom, that has also gone for a virtual reality and Python, Raspberry Pi, 3D printer experience extravaganza. That room's gone. So we're... And we're still teaching year 12, so we are very short of rooms. Now, worst case scenario, tomorrow morning, I'll email out and I'll just say I'll be in the know for a drop-in session or something like that, right? Or I'll find a room. I'll try my best to find room in between lessons. So on Thursday, it will be drop-in session for me to go through any exam questions that you've got, do some exam questions with you or something like that. It won't be an active taught session. Okay, if people want to come in and ask me about chapter 2.8, data security and integrity processes, watch the videos and then come in and ask me about it on Thursday. Do we prefer morning or do we prefer the afternoon? Morning is from 9 till 12. Afternoon will probably be from 1 till 4. In between those times. Oh, I knew you'd all say afternoon because you're all really lazy. Sleep. Sleep is for the week. I've got an exam on Friday. Chem exam, Thursday morning. Okay, it'll be in the afternoon then, won't it? Will I be free tomorrow when we used to have a lesson? Uh, I'm delivering a session at 10.40 to year 10, to 12 year 10s. 12.40 till 11.30 um, tomorrow. So no, I don't think so, Shazil. Right, Thursday afternoon it is. I'll email out something tomorrow morning then. Okay, tomorrow morning. Um, one more thing I want to do before I go. One more thing. And that is SQL. Just want to have a look at it. Just want to talk about it. For some reason, people are uh, are struggling with SQL this year. Some some people might get it, some people might just click, some people not so much. So, what is structured query language? What is it? Once we have our database and it's done, and we have relational databases, re I'm going to ignore Shazil. In relational databases. What is a relational database? What is that? Does anyone know? A relational database. We have flat file databases and relational databases. 
No clue. Okay, more than one table linked together. Right, good. Now, if I was to draw this, okay, you can have, you can have something called a flat file database, right? Which is just a database with all your attributes, which are your columns, and it basically just has all your data in it, right? But think about it, right? If Google had a flat file database for all their hyperlinks, it would be an astronomically large table. So what they do instead is they have relational databases, which is where you take that table and you break it down into smaller subtables and you link them. Can anyone tell me how you link tables together? How do you link them together? Foreign keys with an arrow. Foreign and composite keys. Right. Now then, these every table has something called a primary key in it. Right? Primary keys are unique. Unique. So in order for tables to link together, they must have a foreign key as well, okay? Foreign keys link together. If you take two keys or two attributes in a, in a table and you combine them together to make something unique, that is called a composite key. So there are three keys that you need to know about. Primary keys are just unique data in your table. A foreign key is a primary key from another table. So for example, this primary key in this table here, that, you could copy that and put it in there. Once you take the primary key out of there, make a copy of it and put it in this one, it becomes a foreign key. Okay, a foreign key is a primary key from another table. Simple as that. I'll say it again. A foreign key is a primary key from another table. A composite key is when you merge two attributes together to produce a primary key. So you might take this data here that's not unique, this data here that's not unique, but together when you combine it, it becomes unique. That is a composite key. Composite meaning the merging of two things. All right, that's all. So the process to get from this horrible, slow to search flat file database to our lovely relational databases with our relational database with all our keys and tables, that process, do you know what the process is called to get from flat file to relational databases? What is the process called? Thank you, Adil. It is called normalization. And at A level, you go through first, second, and third normal form. Right? I uploaded some videos on how to do that. I uploaded some videos on what keys are, primary, foreign, and composite keys. I went through an entire um, example from first, second, and third normal form. They would never ask you to go any further than third normal form. Not at A level. Because why would they ask you to do half the job? I meant from first second. Oh yeah, no, no, they, they would, they would, they want because they want to know if you would apply the rules of second normal form. That's all. That's why they'd ask you that. They just want to know if you could apply that rule. If they wanted to get you to get to third normal form, they would, the reason why they would do that is to one show the rules that you know that are involved in third normal form, and then apply SQL to it. So when we talk about SQL, structured query language. A query is a question. So what we're doing is we are asking a question of our tables to return data. 
So when we ask a question of our tables, we expect data to come back. You must get it into third normal form to do that. So there's a couple of different scenarios here. The exam board will provide you with tables that are in third normal form and then ask you SQL questions. Or they will get you to create a table in third normal form and then ask you questions based on that. So if you have not watched those videos, please, if you do anything from now up until the exam on Friday, watch those videos and like and subscribe. Uh, so SQL can do a number of things, right? It is, you, you, you could leave college and become an SQL apprentice, a database analyst, a developer of databases. SQL is incredibly boring in my opinion, but for some reason, I just have a natural ability to do it. And I think it's for me, it's just because it clicked uh, early on, right? But if you don't understand SQL and you're struggling with it, keep going. Keep trying examples because if you if there's one way to learn SQL, it's to practice it, okay? W3 schools do an online database um, and you can basically put write your own SQL commands and it will run your, your queries, okay? It can retrieve data. It can insert, update, delete, create new databases, create new tables, create new keys in there, create views, which is like a filter of a table. So you might not want to show every all the data to some people. Um, so you create a view for them to use. And then also you can set per, um, permissions on tables as well. So with SQL, right, if you look up at the top here, this is a table. All right, a single table. It's got a student ID, it's got some student names, it's got date of births, gender, and postcode. Okay. Technically, I know this is in, this is in third normal form because everything is dependent upon the student ID. So I know that ST6 is James, and that his date of birth is this, and that his gender is this, and postcode is this. All right. There's not much information in there really that could I could split that down. Can I make any more tables out of that? No, I could not. So Forget about third normal form. Just just look at it as a table, right? Here, we've got the select command. Now, one thing that you cannot go wrong with here is the cornerstone of SQL, select. Now, I, I normally write these commands in capital letters because they are commands. If I command you to do something, I'm going to say it quite em with, with emphasis. So, select from... where the first things i learned in sql select from where right so select you're going to say what column do you want to select they're brackets by the way what column right sometimes we use the word attribute for column okay so i might say select what right select the student id column so i'd write in there student id so it would only return what's in this column here you can have multiple columns. You could say select student ID, comma, student name, comma, date of birth if you wanted to. All right? Then you'd say from. What table do you want to select it from? And this, it turns out, is the student table. So I'd say select the student ID from the student table. Where? Where? I could say where student ID or student, let's do student name, student name equals James. Bracket, uh, bracket, bracket, speech, speech, right? That's it. If you want to order it by ascending order, you would use the command in the where ASC or DESC. Yeah, so where DSC is down here, you just put ASC, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. So please, if you don't know anything about SQL at all, then just learn. Select is selecting the column. From is the table you want to extract the information from. And where is the specific command that it's going to look for. So if I run this here, right, if I put in there, let me just get my, let's get my eraser. There you go. Pen, right? Let's go select student ID. 
Right? It's going to return. Does anyone know what this is going to return? Does anybody know what value that's going to return for me? Oh, we're back. Any ideas? Yep, ST6. How do I know that? Because it's going to return the student ID from the student table where the person's name was James. ST6. Simple as that. So you could use a star. That means select everything. That would return the entire row. You could not put a where command in and that would just return all the student IDs for you. You could use a star which says select everything from the student's table where the student ID is ST6. So that would that would return uh, ST6, James, date of birth, 3001, three, zero, zero, whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah, it. these are all the commands you need to know on the screen. This This table thing here all the tables on these slides right now you can have multiple commands select student name date of birth you could have order by order by is a command that i've seen used in exams and where you've got select from where add another one called order by so order by the student name in descending order or ascending order I've seen that in a few exam questions. So order by is the command. Order by. Okay. Now, if you want to insert information, add it in to your student table, this says insert into. Again, this is your command. So no longer do we use select because we're not we're not trying to find something we're inserting it now. Uh, is order by auto ascending or descending? It's actually or it's or it's ascending. That's why there's no example for ascending. But I like to be explicit because it's when you're writing it in an exam, it's like pseudocode, kind of. So I would I would put ASC in there or DESC just to show you know what you're talking about. So insert into the students table. So this is where your table goes. Table. And you would say, what do you want to put in? I want to put in the, the student ID attribute column, the student name, the date of birth, the gender, and the postcode. If I left one of them out, it would insert into column one, two, three, and four, and it might leave this off. So if I'd left that off there, it just wouldn't put anything in that postcode column. That's all. Then you would say the next command is values. So insert students. So into the table, into the attributes, the values, st9 adam 2901-2001, mail, postcode. And that would add in there a new, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Look at how bad that was. It had a new row in. Okay. Now you need to make sure that it includes the primary key. Okay, doesn't include primary key, will not let you do it. Okay, that's called referential integrity. Must have it. So to update something or to change something in existing inside your table, you need to say update the students table. You don't need to specify. Oh, on that example there, right? If, if you left all of them off, if you didn't include any of them, got rid of them all it would because it because it's got one two three four five and that matches with the amount here it would insert them all in automatically hope that answers your question update students table set the student name equals joseph okay so it sets every student's name in the database to joseph not good so you can use the where command to specify the student's name that you want to change. So update the student's table, set the student's name to Joseph, where the student ID is ST6. So James gets replaced for Joseph, Yosefi. Okay, so select, insert, update, now delete. Okay, delete. Delete from the students where the student name is Joseph. So delete from the student table,
where the student name is Joseph. And that will delete every record that has a name as Joseph. So where it had Joseph before, instead of James, it would get rid of them. Can you use update instead of insert into? So update is to change what's already there. Insert into is to add something that doesn't exist. So if it doesn't exist and it wants you to add something new in, then it's insert. If you get asked to change a field, then update is your command you need to use. So delete from the student table where student name equals Joseph. So anywhere, where if you've got multiple Josephs in there, they're all going, mate. They're all going. Um, chum bucket. That's a great question. Inner joins and outer joins are allowed, okay? But I would say don't use an inner join and don't use an outer join. It's a little bit more advanced than A-level, really. It's more like foundation year. Uh, I would stick to what we call sub-select commands. And as you're asking about them, let's have a look at them. So remember, right? Remember. This is the hardest thing that you need to know A-level in databases, right? Select. I'll try and make this really simple for you. Select. Column. From. Table. Where? And what I'll do now is I'll give you um, a specific thing here, right? I'll give you a specific where. Let me let me write this so you can understand it. What? Go away. So let's let's select um, star. Star from apologies about my uppercase lowercase. Select all from forest block where um Let's do block ID. Right, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for this to produce. Uh, let's do. Which one should we have? Which one's going to be a good example? I want to produce this person, right? Let's just let's just produce this one. Why does that keep coming up? Okay. So I want I want this uh, this person here, right? That's that's having felling done, right? So felling. So in order to do this, in order to find that person, they are in a completely different table. So I'm going to ask you now, in forest block, what is my primary key? Which attribute is my primary key in the forest block table? Okay. Primary key is normally first thing in the in the table, right? Are they unique? Yes, they are. I can assume that block ID, more often than not, exams will go with IDs as their primary key, okay? So if I look in here, block ID is actually a foreign key in here. Why? Because a foreign key is a primary key from another table. And because it's a primary key there, it's going to be my foreign key in here, right? In the activity table activity ID is going to be my primary key 
So what I want to do is I want to know the person or the location. I'm going to say select location. I want to know the location of the person that's having felling done. Okay. So it says select location from the forest block table where the block ID is the same as the person that's having felling done. Right. So I want to know which location from the forest block table and I want to know the block of the person that's having felling done. Right. So I know that block 108 is having felling done. So I want this command to return little Sutton. Now it's in a different table. And the thing that links them together is the foreign key. So here we need a sub select command. So where the block ID equals, and then I put some brackets and I go select the block ID. Block ID from, I have to go on a separate line, sorry, activity, from activity, where, remember I'm looking for felling, where activity, oh, I've lost the ability, but activity, Oh my goodness. Activity description. Equals. Felling. Right. Do you understand that? Think of it like this. Okay. That is a sub select. Commit. It's like a whole new SQL statement for another table. Select the block ID from the activity table here where the activity description is felling. So all of that SQL command will return 108. It's just another select inside a select. That is all. How many marks is that? It's a great question. I'll answer it in a minute when we have a look at an exam question. I can't remember off the top of my head. I didn't teach SQL this year, so I've, I've got no knowledge. Two, Omer. Two. Is that it? It's a joke. All right. So, sorry about the squeaky chair. Oh, my back is killing. Right. Okay, fine. Okay. So, please, all it is is a select inside a select. Select the block ID from activity where the activity description is felling. And because it's felling here, it's going to return the block ID of 108. Block ID equals, forget all that SQL, it's going to return 108. And then it says, select the location from the forest block where the block ID is 108. So it says 108. Oh, it's Little Sutton. Right, that's a sub-select command. Now, in addition to this as well, we have, should we write SQL commands in capitals? Because writing capitals takes forever. Um, you, in all honesty, you will not be penalised, Chum Bucket. Okay, it's a great name, by the way. Um, you will not be penalised whatsoever. But I like to write in capitals because it's clear for me to see what commands I've used, if that makes sense. Easier for marking as well. If you want to please the examiner, fine. Now, if you're trying to create or remove a table, if you want to remove an entire table, okay, dead easy, you just put drop and then the table name. It was really good back when I first started doing databases. I used to delete people's uh, databases on their website by using drop command. You, that's called SQL injection. It's a bit naughty. You, you can't get away with that now because people are better than they used to be. So here we've got the words create table, then your table name. Then in brackets, you've got parent ID. Now, when you create a table, you need to use the actual data type name itself. Okay, data type name, and then you've got the number of characters you're going to use. And not null make, basically says that you must use data there. If you try and not put data in there, it will kick off and say, no, you can't, you can't do it. And the reason why it's not null is because you are setting the primary key to parent ID. And that's what we were setting up here. 
So we can't, primary keys cannot be null. All right? Turns out, parent name can't be null. Date of, date of birth date is allowed to be null there. All right? We'll drop DOB from students, delete that column only. Um, yes, it, no, it wouldn't. Would it, would it, would it, wouldn't it, wouldn't it? Drop a column. I don't think. Um, just trying to think if I've ever seen. I think I used a command called not just drop on its own. I might be wrong here, people. I'll have to check this. But instead of just drop, which drops the whole table, you would say uh, drop column. And then you would, I think then you'd say like you, 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 the name of the column. What, what was you saying? Columns. But I'll, I'll check that. But that's, I think I remember something like that. Drop column, drop row. I can't remember. But yeah. Drop column would only drop a single column in the table though. That's what you wanted, wasn't it? Would drop DLB from students. Delete that column. Yeah, yeah drop column. Okay, there you go. Probably depends on the database used. Yes. Right. Fair enough. Now, with these, uh, referential integrity means that you have to um, create references. So making sure that each foreign key refers to an existing record is referential integrity. Yeah, Reference, referential, integrity means it must be, must be there. Records with a foreign key that goes nowhere are sometimes called orphan records. So if a foreign key doesn't have anything to connect to, it doesn't link the tables together. Now, I've never seen anything use referential integrity in the exams yet, I don't think. But it could be it could be possible. So create a table called parents. Make sure your parent ID is not null. Make sure your parent name is not null. Create a date of birth. Student ID references the student's student ID. So this will be the primary key from the student's table. And that creates the foreign key. Where it says on update cascade, it just means that if you update the student ID anywhere, that the foreign key will also update in this table as well. So this is like auto update. Never seen it. Don't know if it'll happen. Never seen it. Varchar is a variable char, variable character. Um, if Omer is still on, I think he was saying something about Varchars. What was that thing you were talking about, Omer, the other day? The, are they dropping Varchar in the examiner report? I think it was. What's the references? Uh, references is when you are creating a foreign key. So it says student ID. So that's the name of the foreign key. And it's from the student table. And it's the student ID column. So if you look up here, yeah, it says create a table called parents. So it creates a parents table. It will create a parent name. It creates a parent ID as well. Parent ID, that's your primary key. And it creates date of birth. And it has a student ID in it. So that's what your table will look like when you create it. The student ID is from the student table. So you'd have a student table, student ID is a primary key, and it would connect to that as a foreign key. Oh, order of N. I'll write to the exam board for you, ideal. Now, these, uh, these are good to do. Uh, you've done these in your lesson before. I created these from the uh, example database given on W3Schools. So you can go through this and test your SQL. No, Shazil. No. 
Now, looking at this here, it's quite hard to see, but this is the kind of style of exam question you'll get given, and I'm sure you've all been through these with uh, Alex or Phil or Matt, depending on who your teacher is. But you've got a table called student, you've got a table called tutors, and you get all of these things that you've got to create SQL for. All of them. Write an SQL command to output the names and tutor numbers of all of the students. You've got write an SQL command to output the names of the students who have the tutor number 378, for example. Okay, so down here, should we just have a bash at some of these? Don't know if people want to or not. Can you see it? Write an SQL command to output the names and tutor numbers. So just names and tutor numbers of all students. Names and tutor numbers. So that's this one. And this one. So in order to do that and extract just those two pieces of information, all I would do is I would say, I'll write next to it. Select, I need the student name, attribute, stu name, comma, tutor number, tutnum, from, what table, it's from the students table, and I don't need a where because it's not specific, so that'll get you one mark. It is. It's good. It's good 14 marks, that. What else we got? Barely. How many How many separate SQL database questions we usually get? Yeah, normally it's like that. Normally you get a full set like that. So on Thursday, if people want to come in and practice their SQL, more than happy to do that. More than happy to... I'll bring whiteboards down to the no, whatever, and you can do them. I can check them. I can, get, I can give you a database and I can just ask you questions verbally and ask you to produce data. Uh, we can do that, no problem. What about the second one? Um, write a SQL command to output the names of students who have a tutor number. Select uh, students who have a tutor number. So student, that's student name. From students. Need a where command this time, where Tutnum. Tutnum equals 378. Okay. So this one. That's it. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Third one down. Now, because the third one down says write an SQL command to change... Excellent, yeah. Update student, set tutor number. So what a deal saying, he's saying update the students table. Yes. Set the tutor num, this one, where it equals three four five. So set it to three four five where the tutor num equals three seven eight. So wherever we've got three seven eight in here, it'll set it to three four five. So cross that out, three four five. And three, four, five. Yeah, good. All right. Uh, what about let's uh, write SQL easy. Write uh, that one. That one. What about? Okay. Uh, can we give me this one? And know the SQL for this one here. Write an SQL command to create a new table called phones, and it contains a telephone number for each room. Assume there is only one telephone per room. Uh, yes, you have to use speech mark for numbers. Yes. And the reason why is because it's a variable char. That's what we set it up as. Variable char. Okay. Would they penalise you? I don't think so. But it's, it's, it's the done thing. Write an SQL command to create a new table. Write in the chat, please. All 
I'll give you the first command. That's all you're going to get. Create table. Create table phones, good. What's the next bit? So we create a table, it's called phones. So I've got phones. Good. What do I do now? What attributes? No, not quite. So we create table phones, okay? And then it's looking for which contains the telephone number of each room. Now the telephone number of each room, that'll be phone num. And we could have, uh, let's do a varchar. Now have we got any idea? We've got room num and Assume that there's only one telephone per room and it contains a telephone number for each room. The telephone number for each room, it could be anything from 11 or uh, like in a hotel, like you, your phone would be, uh, your phone would be the room number. So I could just put uh, brackets three, I suppose. That would be acceptable. You could put 11 in there. You could put 10 in there if you wanted to. I don't know, whatever the phone number would be. Uh, into, yeah, you could you could say that. Yeah, but remember, you wouldn't use phone phone numbers would never be an integer. Why would they not be an integer? Because the only reason you would make a phone number an, an actual number is because you're doing arithmetic operations: addition, subtraction, multiplication. Well, you're not going to do that on the phone, are you? So the phones would always be strings, would always be variable characters or or chats. Um, why not, Omar? <laughs> why not? It's not going to be variable, maybe. Hmm? Oh, my schemes don't have it. That varchar there, that is standard practice. If you're going to write it, you could use character. You could use char if you wanted to. Now, would you actually be penalized for using varchar? Well, any person that can do a database would know what that meant. I still use Varchar now in uh, my workbench in MySQL. Could use Char. Char is in the mark schemes, quite right. Um, but the phone number, now the phone number, it needs to relate to something in here. This is the only tricky bit really and I think this would connect to room num. And the only reason I've put that is because the room, um, the room has to, we have to know which phone number goes to which room. So we know we have room numbers down here. So I imagine you'd have a phones table, which would have the room num and the phone number. And then that would have the actual data itself. I don't know why I've done it like that, like an idiot. They're the only rooms I'm aware of so far. So phone numbers would be probably 106 and 113 according to mine. Um, so the room number is a primary key, yes, because you would have, you'd never have two rooms of the same. So that would be your primary key, yeah. And because it's a primary key here, room number would be a foreign key over here. So I could say to you, 
Uh, what's the phone number for Harris? And you would go, well, Harris is in room 106. Jump down here to 106, and his phone number is 106. That's how it would work with foreign key and a primary key. Yeah, a foreign key is a primary key in another table. There we go. Um, just don't, just don't forget. I open brackets and I close brackets. Okay. Now, people, I've what's that now? Uh, seven. Two hours and fifty minutes. Do you put reference not null before? Uh, I don't think that was in the mark scheme, but if you're writing the SQL, you would. If you know how to do that, then yes, add it in. Now, I think the reason why they didn't do that is because the phone, the room numbers have already been created in the table above there in the example. So, but yeah, add it in if you know how. Um, so, like I said, Thursday afternoon, I'm going to try and make myself uh, not in not in this mark scheme a deal. I'll have a look for other examples for you. Um, let me just check. In no, not in that mark scheme. What about this one? Yep, they do. They're doing that one. I don't know what years these were from. I'll have to check the examiner reports to see if they, they expect you to have it in now. But I would I would recommend that you do. So realistically, in that one, I should have said... Where is it? I should have added a primary key in here. Nope, they are not consistent with Mark schemes. They're doing 2020 C2 SQL question. Thank you very much, Cinnamon. Yes. So if you just have a look at that one there. Okay, if you know if if you know what date you're going to use, add not null to the end, and then if you know what the primary key is, add a primary key. Okay, primary keys go inside the brackets. Typical educas. All right, so Thursday afternoon, look. Yeah, numeric 5-2, so in that one there, so it says in, in the mark scheme, numeric x, 2, 2 has to be present, x can be any sensible number representing pounds. So that is how you show decimal places. Oh yeah, thank you, Cinnamon. So it's 5 long, followed by comma, and then 2, so the 2's decimal places. So 3 will be the whole number, 2 will be the decimal place. that make sense? I'll look at the examples there. Uh, 12, 12.99. Okay. So, like I said, Thursday afternoon, uh, check your email tomorrow morning. I should have some uh, place for you to go and a time frame to go to. Uh, Mahadi, no, I think it's just Judging by this, it's the two has to represent X can be found in the number of pounds. Oh yeah, so it depends. If you put five in there, it should only be. I think it's five. So let's say one, 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 one. This would be. Decimal point would go there. If I'm not mistaken, that's how that's how it is. It's not five for the whole number and just an extra two for the... It tells it where the decimal place needs to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just reading these comments. Two refers to the number of decimal places. Yeah, yeah. That's for the five minutes. Yeah, that's right. The revision session will be on a Thursday afternoon. That is what the people have decided. Yes. 
Okay, people. So, some good stuff covered there. Um, hard brain communication. One thing that I will... Who took two... Uh, the college took it. It's got every subject stall in there. Every subject stall. So every, every subject from around the college has got like a little stand in there that it taught students. Um, one thing that I, need, I will tell you to look at is go and look at the data types and especially how much data um, those data types have because I've got a sneaking suspicion that they'll ask a question like this. They'll ask the typical storage requirements of that data. So that's that last column in there. All right. So do have a look at that when I send it out for you. Um, but thank you very much for coming, everybody. It's uh, it's it's been fantastic. We've had a great time, I'm sure. Um, I've still got ten viewers on. I had like double that before, but hey ho, hey ho. Six marker. Thanks so. Oh dear. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Um, hopefully you've all found it useful some some way or another, and we're gonna get there, and we're gonna smash this paper two exam and then lots of people can have a nice break because it's their last exam um and then the next time i see you will be at celebration evening where we'll celebrate monetize this you'll get peas yes i will one day if it was if only it was about the money if only it was about the money all right i just appreciate you all being here actively engaging and learning so that's good for me i'll take that no problem people oh my goodness heather's here look at that I can't open the donation button. I have no option to do that. I don't know. I don't know when. Oh, hi, Jordan. Hello. I don't know when Celebration Evening is, to be honest. Who? Th thanks, Cinnamon. I don't know who you are, Cinnamon. I don't, know if you, I don't know if you're from my college or not, but you're welcome. You are welcome. 15th of September. Mm. Give us a shout, Cinnamon. Where, where are you from? Been here the whole time. Just not engaging. <whistles> oh, I got I got your email, Raul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bilbra, Bilbra in Nottingham. Well, fancy that. Well, it's nice to have you here. It's quite far away from us, actually. 714 subs, that's right. Going up in the world. Well done, deal. Let's get that A star. That's what we want. Like, subscribe, and share. That's right, Amir. All right, people. I will see you Thursday. Check your emails tomorrow morning. And we'll do some face-to-face -face stuff. All right. Ciao for now. I'll see you Thursday.